Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining another NCL Live. I'm Franz Pear with Cyber Skyline, and we host the National Cyber League competition. These episodes are meant for you to get a deep dive into cybersecurity topics and become a cybersecurity professional. And we run these episodes for you, so please ask in the chat if you have any questions and stick to the end to vote for the poll in the poll so we know what topics to cover in future episodes. I'm going to walk through some slides and we'll dive into a demo and I'll respond to your questions when we get to good breakpoints. This week's topic is Linux Command Line Basics Part 2 and I'm going to switch my screen so we can get started but in the meantime let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. Hilton Head, Texas, Chico, Florida, Arizona, Charlottesville. We got people from everywhere. SoCal. All right, great to see everyone joining us today. So uh, let, let's, let's dive into Linux command line. Um, we had a previous episode where we covered the, the, the very, very basics. This is a more advanced episode. So if you haven't seen that first episode, uh, go back in the Crowdcast, look in our catalog or look in our YouTube channel. Uh, go to the National Cyber League, uh, the National Cyber League user on, on YouTube. If you search it up, you'll find it. Uh, and that one we covered how to just use the command line. But in this episode, we have three primary things that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about file permissions in Linux, uh, user management, and process management. And so we're going to start first with file permissions. Basically, the way that it works within Linux is that you can set permissions on files and folders. Uh, and, and oftentimes, you'll see folders and directories kind of used interchangeably. They're slightly different. I don't think the nuance is worth getting into today, but um, for our purposes today, you can use them interchangeably. There's no difference. So uh, just keep that in mind. So you can set a permission on a file or you can set a permission on a folder. If you set a permission on a folder, that's going to cascade down to kind of like everything that's inside that folder as well. There are three different types of permissions that you can set. You can set read permissions, which is whether or not you can look at the contents of what's inside there, write permissions, which is can you make modifications to the contents, and executable permissions. Uh, that's whether you can run a program. These are often going to be uh, used, a, they're usually gonna have a shorthand for, the, the, for R, R for readable, W for writable, and X for executable. So just keep that in mind. And you can also, not only can you set those permissions, but they're different um, sets of permissions. There's three of them. One is the set of permissions for the user that owns the file. There's a set of permissions for the group that owns the file. So if you can have a, multiple users who have the same uh, set of permissions for that uh, file or folder. And then you have all other users on the system who are not the owner or part of the uh, the, they're not the user owner or they're not the group owner. So to check permissions, the way that you're going to do this is you're going to use the ls command and you want to provide the dash l option. The dash l option gives you that extended information. Normally ls will just tell you the, the names of the files and the folders, but they won't tell you the permissions. And so if you do the dash l, you can see in the screenshot here that we get a little bit more information. Um, specifically in the part before you get to that one there, you have what looks like a series of some dashes, some R's, you got some R's, you got W's, you got X's in there. Um, so let's break this down. The entire sequence is specifying four different things. The first character, what we're looking at is a dash. The dash indicates that it is a file. If it wasn't a file, if it's a folder or a directory, you would see a D there where the dash should be. Following that first character, there's gonna be three sets of three characters. So the next three characters, this R, W, and X, that represents the user's permissions. And then the next three characters, the R, the dash, and I guess I typoed this, uh, apologies for that. It should be R, X, R dash X instead of R dash W. That represents the group's permissions. And then the next three characters, it should be R dash, I wrote W, but it should be X. It represents the permissions for all other users on the system. So there's 10 characters in total. The first one is indicating whether it's a file or a directory. The next three characters indicates the user's permission. 
Then the second set of three characters is the group's permission. And then the last three characters is for all other users on the system. And so you can see here that in this case, the owner, the user, the user owner has the permission to read, write, and execute this file. The users in the group that owns this file can read and execute the file. And the uh, and then everyone else on the system, they can also read or execute this file, but they cannot write to the file. They cannot make any updates. You can also see after the one, there is the uh, the name of the user, the username of the of the owner of the file. And then the second thing there is the name of the group that owns the file. And there's some other information here with like uh, how big the file is and the last modified date, but that's not particularly useful for our purposes. What you're interested in today is everything before the one, which indicates the, uh, the permissions, and then following the one, immediately following the one, you have the name of the user that owns the file and the name of the group that owns the file. So now that we know how to identify the permissions, you're gonna want to be able to make modifications to that. And so there's a couple ways to do this. The, the, the either way that you do it, you're gonna be using this command called chmod, C-H-M-O-D. It, it means change mode. And this will allow you to change the permission settings on a file or directory. One thing to note is that only the person who owns, the user that owns the file or directory or root can change permissions. No one else can change permissions. And um, the way that you need, you, you need to do this is you need to identify whose permissions are you changing and what permissions, permission or permissions do you want to add or remove? And so um, when you're selecting whose permission, you have a couple of options. You have the letter U which stands for the user owner. You have the letter G, which stands for the group owner. And you have the letter O, which stands for other, all the other users. So that's going to specify whose permissions are you changing. And then you are either going to add or remove permissions. And so you do the minus, the hyphen, as a subtraction. We're subtracting, removing permissions. And then you'll do a plus for adding permissions. Then we need to specify what permission or permissions we want to add. And so uh, you will use R for the read permission, W for the write permission, and X for the execute permission. And I've given some examples here to, to show you what that looks like. And so in that first example, we have U plus W. So this means that we're, we are changing permissions for the user owner and we are doing a plus. So we're gonna add a permission and we're gonna add W, the write permission. So this gives the user owner write permissions. You can, in effect, as the owner, you can remove your own write permissions, which prevents you from making any modifications. You might wanna do this if you have like an important file, you don't want to make a modification by accident. You might remove your own write permissions so that you don't accidentally modify this. And you can do that by using the second example here, chmod space, and then again, we're specifying you for the user owner and then a minus for removing a permission, and then W for the write permission. So this removes the user's write permissions so that you can no longer make a modification to the file. You can always go back and give yourself write permissions again to allow yourself to make modifications, but while you do not have write permissions, you can't, you can't edit and, and, and make any modifications to that file. <clears throat> In this, uh, in this third example, you can see that it's only two characters, right? Not three, normally it's a set of three, this is just two. In this example where we have chmod plus x and then my file, we are adding permissions, uh, and in this case adding execute permissions, but because we did not specify whose permissions we were adding, we added that permission to everyone. Right, so all is so that's adding permissions for the user owner, it's adding permissions for the group owner, and it's adding permissions for everyone on the system. Uh, conversely, if we did chmod minus x without specifying whose permissions were changing, 
we would remove everyone's execute permissions, right? So um, if in, in the absence of any specific, uh, like any specific identification for whose permissions you are modifying, it's going to affect everyone's. And in this, in this final example, you can actually see um, instead of specifying uh, one set of permissions to modify, we're actually specifying two. In this example, we have chmod ug plus x my file. So what we're doing is we're going to be adding execute permissions to the user owner and to the group owner, but not to everyone else, only for the user and the group owner. Now, remember that with all of these commands, we are making a modification to what permissions are already there. And so if someone already has a permission and you don't explicitly, let's just say uh, in this example, the last example, everyone, oh, right? Everyone, all the users on the system already have execute permissions. And we run this final command here, ug plus x, even though we're not explicitly saying that we are giving everyone else execute permissions, if they already have execute permissions, they're not losing those, right? So this is specifically adding new permissions. And conversely, um, if you try to remove a permission that's already not there, it, it will, it'll have no effect. It won't like, you know, you, it's not like a double negative. It's not going to, uh, trying to remove a permission that's already not there is not going to magically add it. And it's not gonna give you an error. It's just not gonna have any effect. So this is a, a very easy way for you to understand like how do you wanna add and remove permissions. And there's a second way to do this, which is a little bit more sophisticated, um, but I'm gonna answer this question here. Someone's asking, I'm assuming that root cannot be stripped of permissions even if the owner. Um, so root can be the owner and root can strip themselves from those permissions but they will not be able to lock themselves out from changing the permissions again in the future. And so as the root user, you could remove the right permissions for root on a file and root will now not be able to edit the file, but root can still add their right permissions back in so that they will then be able to do it. So um, root can lock themselves out temporarily, but not permanently if that answers your question. So let's get into the more sophisticated way of doing it. Um, the second way to do this with Chmod is to use a numeric format. Basically, instead of using the UGO and the plus and the minus and the uh, WR and X, you can actually consolidate all these into numbers. And so, there are three different permissions. There's the, uh, the user permission, the group permission, and the all permission, the everyone else permission, right? You can represent the permissions that each one of those groups should have with a number. And the way that you get that number is that you will, um, you will represent each type of permission with a number and then add them all together. So one for execute permission, two for write permission, and three for read permission. And you just add them together for what you want. And if you don't want it, you don't add that number. So let's just say we wanna give access to do everything, read, write, and execute. That would be four plus two plus one, which is seven. Let's just say we only want execute, that's just one. If we only want read, that's just four. If we want read and execute, that's four plus one, which is five. So, you will go to each one of these three sets and you will say, hey, the user should have read, write, and execute. And that's this example that I have here with this 355, that will generate seven. You get the seven by saying, read is worth four, write is worth two, and execute's worth one. So I'm gonna add them all together, I'm gonna get seven. And that will be the number I use for the user owner. And then if I wanna give the group owner only, uh, only read and execute permissions, that's four plus one, right? Read is four, execute is one. I add them together, I get five. And so 
in the group owner position, I'm going to put a five. And then in for everyone else, um, apologies, I made another typo here. <laughs> I, I did a five, right? So that should be four plus one so that everyone else has read and execute permissions. And this is a little bit more complicated. You have to do some math here. You gotta remember like, like four is read and two is write and one is execute. So that's a little bit more challenging. Um, you can do these either way, right? But you might see people in examples doing it one way or another. And I know this is a little bit more of a complicated topic, so I'm gonna stop here and I'm going to read the chat and answer some questions. So we have Mark here, this is, a, this is more of a comment, saying chatter plus I will disallow edits even by root. That is correct. It's a little bit more advanced than what we want to cover today. Um, but what that does is it makes uh, a file immutable, which means that no one can make a modification. Um, but then you can also do chatter minus I, and then it will make it uh, mutable again. Um, so root will always be able to give themselves and uh, remove their, their own permissions and give themselves the permissions back. Patrick is asking why not three two one instead of four two one. Um, it has to do with math and uniqueness. So if the options were three two one versus four two one, then if you put the number three, it's ambiguous whether or not you mean only read permissions versus no read permissions but write and execute permissions. Right. Um, so if you have, if, if, if read were three, you couldn't, you couldn't differentiate between just read permissions, um, versus read and execute permissions because both of those values would be three. And that's why it has to be a four. Um, Tom is asking, are those numeric values assigned permanently? So Four, two, and one, these numbers, they're not going to change unless something drastic happens with the way Linux works. But if you assign the number, if you say chmod755 my file, and you decide, oops, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do 733 or 700, you can always make that modification, right? But four will always be read permission, two will always be write permission, one will always be execute permission. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next, uh, the next slide where we're gonna cover ownership of files. So the way that this works is that you're gonna use the chown, C-H-O-W-N, which means change ownership command. And what you can do with this is you can change just the user that owns the file, or you can change the user and the group that owns the file. And um, the group part is optional, right? And so in this first example I have here, I say chone my user, my file. And that's literally just going to make my user the new user owner. If my user already owns my file, it doesn't do anything different. It, it'll, it'll have no effect. If you also want to change the group, you have to do chone my user colon my group and then the file that you want to change uh, ownership of. And so um, this changes both the user and the, uh, the user owner and the group owner at the same time. If you want to change just the group without using, um, without changing the owner, you have two options. One is you can just leave the owner the same and then run the command, or you can use another command, which I'm blanking on right now, Linux. I'm just going to do a quick Google search, Linux change. Uh, group ownership, dhgrp, change group. So you can do that as well. Um, as always, if you want to learn how to do something in Linux and you don't know what command to use, just a Google search is probably your best bet. Another thing to note though, is only root may change ownership of a file. So even if you are the owner of a file, you can't give your file to someone else. Root has to do that. All right, so the next thing is uh, that we want to cover is how are users stored? Um, the way that, that users are represented on your computer in Linux 
is that it's just like an entry in, in two files. There's Etsy password slash Etsy slash password. Uh, and it's password spelled P-A-S-S-W-D. And that stores information about all the user accounts. Ironically enough, it doesn't actually store the passwords. <laughs> um, that goes into another folder, another file called slash Etsy slash shadow. And that, in that includes all of the encrypted user passwords. So these are separated out into two separate files. Uh, the reason being is because the Etsy password that fi that file with all of the user accounts, it's, it, it generally needs to be accessible by everyone on the computer because you need to know who else is on the computer and a lot of programs need to know who else is on the computer. But you don't want to have your passwords in that file if everyone can read it. And so that's why there's a separate file called Etsy Shadow that includes the encrypted passwords and that is restricted by default. You can always change this if you want using the chmod command, but I highly recommend you don't because you could mess it up and lock yourself out of your system. Um, but that will store the encrypted passwords and that's not available for everyone because if other users could access that file, they could get the encrypted passwords and they can do password cracking like we covered in the previous episode. And then they could start logging into all the users on the system, right? And so that's why Etsy password is available to everyone because you might be running a program that will interact with other users on the system and anyone should be able to do that, but they shouldn't have access to everyone's passwords because then users on the computer could crack other people's passwords and log in as them when they shouldn't be able to do that, right? So very important why these two are separate. It's also very important that um, if you want to play with these things, do it in virtual machine and take a snapshot. I really don't want people crying and blaming me for uh, teaching them how to modify the permissions on Etsy password, Etsy shadow, and then you lock yourself out of your computer permanently, right? If if you don't, if if you remove permissions, if you do like chmod 000 on Etsy shadow, or Etsy password, like your computer is gonna have all sorts of issues. And it's, uh, it's either gonna be it's basically, it gets, it's basically going to be super hard to like near impossible to get yourself out of that situation. Um, and I just, just don't go there, right? If you want to mess with it, take a snapshot, mess with it, revert to snapshot, but please, please, please do not do that on a computer that cannot undo um, very easily. All right, so that's how users are stored. Let's actually take a look at what's in these files. So in Etsy password, um, this is what it looks like. And I cropped it out. Um, so I, I printed out Etsy password and you can see there's one entry for the root user and there's another entry for daemon. A lot of uh, background processes and services on Linux will have their own user accounts. They're not, you can't log into those user accounts by default. Um, they require... Uh, they're, they're just there so that a program can run in the background with its own set of permissions so it won't interfere with other things, but no one can log into it by default. You can always go in and modify that. Um, but let's break down what each of these lines represents. So I'm only looking at the, the first line in the file with the root user, and there's seven fields in here, and they're separated by colons. The first thing in here is the username of the account. The second thing is... Um, an X or a lack of an X if the that indicates whether or not that user has a password. And then you have a user ID and then a group ID. So the user ID, this is just a, a counter that starts from zero and it goes up. Every time you add a user, it will increment. So it'll be zero, one, two, three, four, five, right? Same thing with groups. By default, when you create a new user, it also creates a new group that's also this, that has the same name of, of that user. Um, and then after you have the user ID, the group ID, you have a section for comments. This is generally like where people put in, this is meant, this is back in like the nineties when like, you know, people were logging to Linux systems and they had directories with everyone's like office number and phone number and contact information. Th this is where you put that in. You put that in this comments section. Um, after the comments is the home directory. So this is the, the, the file path that gets to the 
directory of the, the, the home directory of that user. And you can see in this example, it's slash root. And then the last section here, the last field is the path to the default shell program. And so you can have different shell terminals that uh, in this instance, it's bin bash. When I go through the demo, you actually see that it's not bin bash, it's bin, uh, bin ZSH because I use a different shell on this computer than I did uh, for, the, for the screenshot. And so every user can choose what, what terminal shell they would like. Um, but you can see here in line two, the daemon user has a, a no login a no login shell so there is no shell for the daemon user let's move on to etsy shadow and um root has the ability to access etsy shadow but not other users and etsy shadow has eight fields and i'm looking just at the first entry here for the root user you can see that daemon here it's missing a password. It's got this little star. Um, and so you can't log in as the daemon. But um, dissecting these fields here, you have the username root. We saw that previously. And then the second field here, this is the encrypted password. And so when you are cracking Linux passwords, if you get access to the Linux terminal and you have a root user or you have root permissions, you can print out Etsy shadow, grab all those encrypted passwords and start cracking them. And that's how you do it, is you go to the Etsy shadow file and that will give you all of the passwords for everyone on that system. They're encrypted though, so you have to go and crack them so you get the decrypted passwords. The other fields here, I'm just gonna run through this really quick. Um, field number three, that's how long it's been since the password was last changed. And for some reason, um, well, I know why, but like it's, it's uh, it's it's using the Linux e, e, uh, the Linux Epic Linux Epic, uh, the Linux Epic is January first, nineteen seventy. So um, this number is how many days have passed since January first, nineteen seventy until the current date, uh, or the date when the password was last changed. Field number four is um, like how long it's the minimum number of days between password changes. So. Uh, if you, it's set to, it's set to zero, but if, if it were set to like one or two or three, you'd have to wait one or two or three days to change your passwords again. Um, the field number five is the maximum number of days the password is valid. So if you ever had a reminder for, Hey, <laughs> change your password on our system, this is how it's implemented in Linux. Um, in this case, it's nine, 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 it's five nines, right? So it's really long out there, probably you're going to outlive, or this is going to outlive your lifespan and you won't have to change your password. And field number seven, uh, six is going to be, um, how, how, like how long of a warning are you going to get that you have to change your password? So in this case, it's seven days. Uh, number seven is an indicator. If your account is disabled in this case, it's not, which is why it's blank. And why you see at the end of the line, there's just a bunch of colons next to each other. Cause there's just nothing there. And then number eight, this is the date when the account was disabled. In this case, it's not disabled. And so there's no date. And again, this is using days past since January 1st, 1970. So that's Etsy password. That's Etsy shadow. Now let's figure out how do we create users and remove users. So very, very simple. Um, you can create a user by using add user and the username. Uh, and then you can delete a user using user Dell and then the username. Now you might be wondering why the heck is user adding a user, add user and removing a user, user Dell? Like why is it backwards? Um, the answer is that it's not, there's actually a second command called um, user add. That's the one that came originally. Um, and so it used to be user add and user Dell. The problem is that by like that, that user add may not configure all the settings that you want by default. Like it might not create a home directory for the user. It might not set a password on the user. Um, it depends on your system, what the default behavior is. And so I personally always use add user because add user will collect all that information from you so that you don't accidentally create a user that doesn't have a home directory or doesn't have a password and then have to deal with that headache. Um, and if you want to do any of these two operations, you're going to need root privileges. So it's not like anyone can make a user. It has to be root.
So to switch users, you're, you will want to use the SU, the switch user command. And the way that you run it is you literally just type in SU space and then the name of the user that you want to log in as. Now, a couple caveats here. One is that if you run this with root permissions, you will bypass the password check. So you, normally what you need to do is you need to type in the password for that user. Root can log in as any any user, so it doesn't matter, right? Um, and so you won't be prompted if you log in as, if you are the root user or you run SU with root privileges, you won't be prompted for that user's password. You might be prompted for your own password if you use sudo. And in, in we have two examples here, right? So in the first example, I have just SU and then my user. And so this is just logging in normally as my user and you'll have to type in the password for my user if there is one, um, if you're not root. And in this second example, I do sudo su my user, which will log you in as my user. You will not need to type in my user's password, but if, uh, but, but sudo might ask you to, um, to type in the, your, your password to access those root permissions, right? So this can be a little bit tricky and complicated. You might forget like whose password am I typing in? Basically remember that like, if you're running a sudo or you're running as root, you're only gonna be typing in your password, right? Um, and if you are not, then you're gonna be typing in the password of the user that you're logging in as. So a little bit complicated. I'll show an example of this in the demo. Um, after this, we are talking about process management, or actually, sorry, we're, we're talking about um, changing passwords. So it's the pass WD command, the password command. If you type it just normally pass WD, it will change your password. If you type it and then specify someone else's username, it will change their password. So you, if you're, if you're root, you can, you can go and change other people's passwords. If not, I believe you have to, uh, either it won't work or you will need to type in their old password first before you can change it. Okay, now we're talking about process management. So there are a lot of programs that are running on your computer um, and you can see what those are if you run either the PS command or the top command. Now, normal PS, it will just show you a simple listing of all the processes, processes that you've created and are running and I think even there's an additional caveat, which is um, in that terminal session that you currently have. You can run PS aux, which will show a listing of all processes. So not just your process processes, but everyone else's processes. It will also show you uh, processes that aren't running on your terminal session, and it will give it to you in like a big list format with all this extra information. Another thing that you can do is you can run the top command and that will be a live interactive display of all of the processes as the update. This is basically like a command line version of task manager. PS will just print, it's a snapshot. It's like everything that's running right now. Not anything that was running, like, like not, nothing that's running after you run the command. Just everything that's running when you type in the command. If another process starts running after you type in the command, you're not gonna see it because it already gave you the results, right? And so if you wanna get live updates, you use the top command. So let's kill a process. Um, very straightforward, there's a kill command and then there's a p kill command. So the kill command is going to require the PID. This is the process ID. You can get the process ID from PS or from top. And so then you'll just type in kill the process ID and, and then um, without dash nine, it just attempts to kill it. And then if you do dash nine, it's a force kill. Now keep in mind, you might need to have permission, you might need to have privileges to kill that process, right? So if you're running as a non-root user and you try to kill a root user's process, you don't have permissions to do that, it'll give you an error. If you're root though, you can kill anyone's process, even your own, and it doesn't matter. So just keep in mind that there's some permission checks with that. If you use pkill, instead of providing the process ID, you're actually gonna pro uh, provide the name of the process and you have to be very, very careful because it will kill all processes that match that. And so you might inadvertently 
kill other processes, which maybe they use. Um, so I'm in this example, we're killing Vim. If for whatever reason there was a process running that had Vim somewhere in its name, then it will also kill that. So this doesn't kill one process, this kills like all of them with that in the name of the process. All right, so I've been running my mouth way too long now. I'm gonna um, answer some questions in the chat, but I think we just jump straight into a demo afterwards because uh, you, know, you wanna see how all this works. So uh, Sabina is asking who has access to Etsy Shadow. I'll cover that in the demo so you'll be able to see that. And then I got a question here, how to reset root permissions. I'm not entirely sure um, what you mean by reset root permissions. There's no like, you can't reset permissions. You can manually set uh, new permissions or change them, um, but you can't really reset them unless you remember what they were and then manually send them to that. There's no like undo button for permissions. Um, but yeah, just like Chamad and then the, the new permissions that you want. If those happen to be the same as old one, that gives you the effect of resetting. But like, if you don't remember what the old permissions were, you can't undo, you can't reset. Manny's asking, when would dash nine be necessary? So dash nine is necessary if like the process is like frozen, it's like stuck. And sometimes it's just not responding properly. And so, you have to you have to um, you have to do dash nine in order to force it to uh, in order to force it to close. Can you use star to wildcard the kill processes? I don't know. I haven't tried it, but something tells me it's a bad idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to cover that today. But you're more than you're more than um, welcome to try on your own computer. All right, so um, let's switch over to the demo. And you can see right here that I've got my login. I'm just gonna log in real quick here. And on the right side, I've got all the commands that I'm gonna run today. So um, that's a quick resource there if, um, if, you, if you want a reference for what the heck I'm doing. So. Let's start by creating a new user. So right now I am running as the Kali user and I'm my default group is the, or sorry, this is the host name, but um, I'm running as the Kali user. I'm also in the Kali group. Like I mentioned by default, a group, when you create a new user, it will also create a group with the same name as that user. I'm going to type in add user, new user and I'll get an error because you need to be root, right? So I'm going to type in sudo add user new user. When I do this, it's going to ask for some information. One is it's going to make me type in my password. So I'll type in my password there. And then you can see here it's creating a new user. It's creating a new group called new user. And it's adding the new user to the new group, uh, to, the, to the new user group. That's a little bit confusing. Um, and then it's asking for the password. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna type in a password and I'm gonna show you guys Etsy shadow. So you can try to pat, you can try to crack the password that I typed in here. Um, I'm not gonna make it too hard. So it's making me retype it again. And then it's asking for some extra information. This, was, is, this is what goes in that comment section. And then it's asking me to confirm. I'm gonna type in Y, hit enter. Cool, we have a new user. How do we know we have a new user? Well, let's look at Etsy, Etsy, uh, Etsy password, right? Etsy password. There's a bunch of things in here um, from all the default accounts that got set up with the programs that I installed. You can see here's the root user at the top. Root's always gonna be at the top. It's always gonna be zero. And then there's, here's my new user here. So I create a new user, their ID is 1001, their group ID is 1001 as well. And this is their home directory, it's slash home slash new user and they are using bash. But um, me as root, uh, or the root user on here is using ZSH. And um, can I see myself Kali? 
my Kali user is also using ZSH. All right, so let's take a look at Etsy Shadow. Cat Etsy Shadow. Error, permission denied, right? Because I'm not root. And let's take a look at what these settings are. So you can see here, Etsy Shadow, we read them in sets of three. The first one is an indication if this is a file or a directory, because it doesn't have a D because it has a dash. This means that this is a file. Then we read three here, read and write. So that means that um, everyone in, uh, all the, sorry, so read and write for the owner of this file, which in this case is root. So the root has read and write permissions for Etsy shadow. Then we have the next three, one, two, three. Um, this means that there is read permissions for the group owner. The group, the, the group that owns this is shadow. So there's a shadow group that has read permissions for Etsy shadow, but it does not have write permissions. Only root can write to Etsy shadow. And then there are no permissions for everyone else. So by default, no one else on the system can read, can write, can execute Etsy shadow. All right. So um, I want to read it though, right? So we, we read the permissions. I know now that when I run as normal Kali, the Kali user that does not have root permissions, I get an error. So I need to do sudo. So let's do sudo Etsy. Uh, let's do sudo cat Etsy shadow. Let's print out all the passwords on here. And this is a, uh, a challenge for you all out there try to figure out what the password is on here, right? So um, there's the password. Go and uh, go and crack it if you would like. <laughs> it's not stay on, on screen for that long. So um, the root user can get all the passwords, which means that if your root user account gets hacked or if you have an account example here, Kali that has root permissions and my Kali user's password gets stolen or, or cracked, right? An, an attacker could then get the password list, the encrypted password list for everyone on the system and crack all of their passwords, right? So it's very, very important that the passwords of the root user and the passwords of anyone that has root permissions are carefully kept and not, and not compromised. And, um, and make sure you don't mess with the permissions on Etsy Shadow or Etsy Root because that can cause all sorts of issues. All right, so let's move on to, um, now that you see how all that works with creating the new user and looking at the passwords, let's create a file and start messing around with it. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna type in echo. I'm gonna say, hello world. And I'm going to create a new file.txt. And so let's check by default what permissions did file.txt get all right r w r and r so that means that the kali user has read and write permissions the kali group has just read permissions and everyone else also has read permissions but like anyone in the kali group and everyone else on the system they cannot write and they cannot execute this file this file doesn't have anything to execute, but if it were an execu executable like a script or like a binary file, like in a binary program, um, that execute uh, permission would be important. So let's test this theory, right? Because in theory, a the new user that we just created should be able to read this file, but not modify it. And so I will do SU. I'm going to log in as new user. It's going to ask for the password for the new user. I'm going to type that in. And then I'm going to do an LS and I can see there's file.txt. And if I print out file.txt, there's hello world, right? So that's, that shows that I indeed have read permissions, but let's just say I want to make a modification. I'm going to change the contents of file.txt. I get an error now because I get a permission denied error because my user, new user is not the owner of the file and it is also not in the Kali group. So that doesn't work. All right, so 
maybe let's make it work, right? So let me let me exit out of new user, and you can do this by typing the exit command. And so this will log me out of the new user and put me back into Kali, the Kali user. So I'm back as the Kali user. And what I wanna do first is show you that um, even though I'm the owner of file.txt, I can lock myself out of it. And so I'm gonna do chmod uh, minus w, so that's write, read, and execute, right? So I'm gonna lock myself out. And then let's, let's just see that I locked myself out. All right, zero permissions. No one can do anything with this file. Let's test that theory. So if I do cat file.txt, permission denied. If I do echo hello world back into file.txt, permission denied. That doesn't work either. All right, what if I try to delete file.txt? Is that gonna work? Well, actually, <laughs> trick question. Yes, it will work because, um, well, actually, let me make sure I don't shoot myself in the foot. Yeah, it will work because I'm still the owner, but I can't modify the file. I can remove it, um, but I cannot modify the contents of the file. So you can see that it's gone again. I'm going to recreate it. So let me re recreate it here. I'm going to change the permissions again, chmod. So now we don't have any permissions on the file again. We just, we just undid what I did there. And let's give myself read permissions, but not write permissions. So let's say chmod, and um, I'm gonna do this with u for user plus, and then I'm going to do read, right? So plus r file.txt. So let's confirm that ls. There's that one r. That one r represents read permissions on the user owner. And so that means I can now print out file.txt, but I cannot overwrite it. Permission denied. Um, all right, so now let's give um, read and write permissions to myself, to the user, and to the group. And I'm gonna use the numeric version of this, right? So um, the way that it works is that one is execute. Uh, the execute has a value of one. Um, write has a value of two, and read has a value of three. And so if we want only read and write permissions, that's two plus four. Wait, sorry, I don't, I don't remember if I said that right. One is execute. Two is read, four is, is uh, I need to pull up my slides. <laughs> Let me pull up my slides. Okay, one is execute, two is write, four is read. I, Paul, I don't remember if I said that right the, uh, correctly the first time around, but that's what it is. One is execute, two is write, four is read. And so if we want read and write, it's four plus two, that's gonna be six. So if we want read and write just for the user and for the group, we need to do chmod 660 file.txt. And then if we get the permissions, you can see there's the read, there's the write, and it's only on the user owner and the group owner. There are zero permissions on the on the on on everyone else. All right. So now that we've done that, let's just confirm. Do we now have write permissions? And so if I try to echo, this should work. And indeed it does. Um, now we're going to do now let's test out the group permissions. So we have the new user. The new user um, has a group that's called new user, which is really confusing. Um, so I'm going to change ownership. New user, new user. I'm gonna give ownership of the file to the new user. 
So now if I look at it, I am Kali. I'm the Kali user. I'm in the Kali group. I am not in the new, I'm not new user and I'm not in the new user group, which means that I shouldn't have permissions. I should be locked out. And if I try to cat it out, I get a permission denied. And if I try to uh, make a modification, I also get permission denied, right? Both of those don't work because I'm not the user that owns this file and I'm not in the group that owns this file. But um, what I want to do is um, let's, let's change the permissions now or let's change ownership now so that I can read it because I'm in the correct group. So I'm going to change permissions. I'm going to say chone and I'm going to make it so that new user still owns that file, but I'm going to, I'm going to put myself, I'm going to make the group that owns this, the Kali group, and I'm in the Kali group. And so if I do this, now I should be able to cat out the file, right? Because even though I am not the owner of this file, I am in the group that has permissions for this file. And so um, changing that ownership that way gave me access again. And I can always just, because I have a, uh, root permissions, I can always just give it back to myself. I can say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it back. Uh, I now control the entire file again. Right? So, um, that's how permissions work. You can change the owner, you can change the group, you can change one or the other, and then you can set the different permissions at the different levels. So, um, now we've got all that sorted out. Let me just delete this file because we don't need it anymore. Um, that's, so that's how permissions work. We've created, we've created users, we've removed, well, we haven't removed users, I'll do that at the very end. Um, actually, I'll do it now. Let me just remove the user, right? So we're going to do user del, new user, and this is gonna fail because you need to be root to do this. So it gives you permission denied, and even says cannot lock Etsy password. Um, so cannot lock means that it couldn't um, get access to Etsy password. Um, I think probably because it doesn't have right permissions to Etsy password. So I'm going to type in sudo user del, and now we've deleted the new user. And so let me confirm that. Let me specifically check Etsy password, and you can see the new user is missing. And I need to do sudo cat Etsy shadow, and you can see new users missing. So I've deleted that user from the system. And if I try to do switch user, new user, user doesn't exist, right? It's gone, gonzo, bye-bye, right? So really easy to delete user accounts. <laughs> um, there's not even really a confirmation. So be careful with that. Anyway, let's move on to process management. So I mentioned that you can use the PS command to get a snapshot of all the current processes running. And that's just in my terminal here, just this one terminal tab. If I type in PS, you can see that um, I get ZSH, which is the shell that I'm currently running. That's that's the terminal itself. And then I have PS, which is the command I just ran, right? So it detected itself when I ran the command. And you can see here's the PID. This is the process ID for these commands. And so if I did kill 1325, my window would close because I'd kill my own shell and I'd, it would disappear. Um, so I'm not gonna do that, but We'll, 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 I'll show an example of, of, of killing a process. So, um, the, but when we just did PS by itself, we are not seeing all of the processes. It's just the processes that I'm running in this terminal and not everything else. And so if you wanna see everything else, you do PS aux. And there's a ton of different things running in here. Um, you can see like I'm running what? I don't know what most of the stuff is to be honest, but at the very bottom, you can see this is where I actually ran PS aux that showed up again. Um, there's a mouse pad process. Here's the terminal, the ZSH shell. And it looks like there's like, this is VMware. This is VM tools because I'm running this in VMware. Here's some power manager. I don't know what all these things are. These were all kind of started like by default when I, when I logged in and when the computer started, but if I look at these fields here, I can see the user uh, that is that has started the process. 
the PID, so this is the process ID of the process. Um, how much CPU is it taking? How much memory is it taking? Don't know what these things are. You can probably Google it. Um, when did it start? Um, all right, so you can see the timestamp there. All of these things are, and then the actual command, the actual program that's running. Now, let's actually take a look at top, which will give us the live update. And so you can see here that um, it's updating every couple of seconds or so. It looks like every three seconds. Here's the current system time. And you were saying basically the same stats, right? The PID, the user, memory consumption, CPU consumption. Um, this is, like, like I said, this is effectively a task manager for Linux command line. The difference is that you can't kill... I don't believe you can kill. Uh, I don't believe you can kill tasks directly from here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a new terminal and I'm going to start Vim. Vim is a text editor, and I'm going to find the Vim process and I'm going to kill it. And so let's go in here, and uh, this is top is not great for searching for things because you have like so many entries in here. So I'm actually going to close top and I'm going to run PS aux because I don't want this constantly updating and moving like my position in the list. And I'm going to specifically search for Vim because if you recall, just doing PS aux gives you a ton of stuff and it's hard to read it. So I'm going to do a search using grep. So this command, I'm getting a listing of all the processes on the computer. I'm gonna send that to grep and grep is gonna filter it and it's gonna just show me anything that has the vim, vim in that line. And you can see here, I get two responses. One is the actual vim program and the second is my actual search for the program, for the, the vim program, right? So that's my actual search and this is vim itself. And so uh, we have to remember that the process ID was actually the second column. The Because I did grep, I tossed out anything that didn't have vim in the line. So that means that we lost the headers for the results. So this is the process ID for vim. I'm going to copy that. And you can see right now, um, as it currently stands, I can type normally here, right? I didn't kill the process yet. So I'm going to do kill dash nine. I'm going to force kill. And I'm going to paste my entry. I'm going to hit enter. And then let's see if I can find it in, in, in PS. If I do this, you can see we went from two entries to one entry. And you're always going to get the kind of this one entry here because your actual like search for the processes is going to show up in the results. So. Uh, we went from two to one, and so this one is, is missing, right? So we killed this, it's gone. Now let's go check in our tab. You can see it says killed, and my terminal's acting, acting all wonky because we just, we didn't kill it gracefully in the, in the tab. This is acting really weird. So I'm going to type in reset, and that should fix that for, my, for myself so I can type in normally now. Um, but we force killed that program. And so if you're root, you can like force kill programs that, that, that you're running or that other users are running. All right. So let's try this again using P kill instead. So I'm going to type in Vim again. Here's our, ta here's our text editor. It, it seems to be working right now. I'm going to, uh, do the search. I can see there's a new Vim process and you can see that the PID, the PID, is different. We killed 8009, now it's 8117. Um, this number is going to keep increasing. I think there's some sort of maximum and then once it hits the maximum, it like resets or something like that. Um, but when you kill a process, there's going to be, and you start a new one, that new one will get a higher PID number. So let's kill this using pkill and I'm gonna type in pkill vim and this should just kill the vim command. And then if we do the search again, you can see it's gone. And if I go to my tab here, uh, terminated, right? So um, now something to note, when I ran, let me reset this again. So when I ran Vim and 
I did P kill. I didn't do dash nine. And this says caught deadly signal term finished. And it says ZSH terminal uh, terminated Vim. This did a graceful shutdown. This is basically the equivalent of like, um, like you tr like trying to close the program and giving it an opportunity to do anything it needs to do when it closes. That could mean like maybe it saves uh, your current work before it closes, right? When you do dash nine, that is a force kill. That means that it's going to shut off the program right away. It's not going to give the program any opportunity to do any cleanup, to do any last minute saves or whatnot. That's the reason why you'd want to use dash nine versus, uh, that's going to be the difference between well, uh, dash nine and not dash nine. If you don't use dash nine, it gives the process an opportunity to do some cleanup before it closes. If you do dash nine, that's a force kill. It says you're going out right now, no opportunity to do anything. You want to use dash nine specifically if you have a program that's like frozen, right? Like it's stuck. It's not closing properly, right? And so you do the force kill because um, when you do uh, without the dash nine, it gives the program an opportunity to stop. And if it's frozen, it's stuck, then it doesn't need that opportunity. You need to kill it, right? So that's why you do the dash nine. And... Um, you know, you use those when like, however you feel like it. Sometimes the program doesn't need to do anything when it closes. Um, in this case, you can see that Vim actually did something. It says, hey, uh, I got a deadly, deadly signal term, terminate. Um, and it says finished. So there was something that it did while it was closing and then now it's announcing that it's finished. And so it exited gracefully. But if you do the dash nine, and I'm gonna show that, we're gonna show that again, if you didn't catch it the first time around, if I do the dash nine, this is a force kill and it's not going to get an opportunity to terminate and it just says killed. And we don't see, we don't see the um, message that said, hey, uh, I got the signal, I'm closing, right? It just died. So um, that's the big difference. So I appreciate you all joining us today. That will, that will conclude my demo here. I'm going to stick around to answer, to answer any of your questions, but I'm also going to put up a poll. You know, I want to know what do y'all want us to cover, right? What are you interested in, um, in having us do deep dives? And in the meantime, I'm going to answer any follow following questions. So we got a question here. What, what's better to use a virtual box or VMware? This is entirely personal preference. Both of them will accomplish the job. Both of them will do exactly what you need to do. Um, I personally use VMware because that's what I originally started using and I understand it better. But I know a lot of people who use VirtualBox and there's is no problem at all. So um, that's personal preference. Tom's asking, will you post a video on YouTube? Yes, it will get posted on YouTube. Um, it takes a little bit of time for us to uh, to do the editing and post it on there. But if you want to watch this again, you can come here on Crowdcast and you can watch it immediately after we finish today's session. And in a couple of days, it'll show up on YouTube. All right. So it looks like that's all the questions. I really appreciate you all sticking around today. Um, Give us any feedback, let us know. Make sure to sign up for the National Cyber League if you have not yet already. There's a button for it on um, the Crowdcast. And um, and you can, uh, you can go in, you can do the gym right away in about a week. Um, what is, it's a week and some change, right? Next, next Monday uh, on October, let me get the date. On October 11th, the preseason will start. So, if you're new to NCL, I highly recommend doing the preseason. If you're a returning veteran, it's always a nice refresher. And uh, just go and do the, uh, the preseason. It's not mandatory, but it's great practice, right? So um, that'll be available on October 11th. Go ahead, register, sign up, and um, get started. If you need ways to get started, come back, review the videos that we have here on Crowdcast or on YouTube. There is the gym, which you'll have access to immediately as you register. And we also have the Trove. 
So that's trove.cyberskyline.com. That's where we're going to have our written blog posts and guides and tutorials. We have a guide in there already for the basics for uh, fundament, fun, IT fundamentals or computer fundamentals for getting started in cybersecurity. So there's a lot of resources out there. And as a final thing, you can also join the cyber the 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 Cyber Skyline Slack. If you go to cyberskyline.com slash Slack, you need to be registered when you do this, but that will give you an invite to the Slack channel. And we have a Slack channel uh, for the for the fall season. And you can go in there, you can ask people questions, get advice, get tips and tricks. Um, up until the game start, after that happens, you can't uh, get or receive help. But there's a lot of resources out there um, to, to, to get learning and to get started in cybersecurity. So again, appreciate you all joining us today. Um, have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll catch you all next Thursday. That's going to be our next session. So save it in your calendar. Uh, that will be October, October 7th. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you.